Good afternoon. I'm Jennifer Gross, CEO of American Friends of Tel Aviv University. It is my pleasure to welcome you to Tau Talks, a series of conversations between leading Tel Aviv University alumni and friends and AFTAU board member and Tau alum, Aaron Tartakovsky. Tel Aviv University is a global research university known for innovation, discovery, and a drive to make the world a better place. One of the best ways to showcase the university is through our alumni and friends, the creators, the inventors, the innovators, and global citizens who are changing the world. Today you will meet Ifat Ohon, Senior Managing Director and Head of Blackstone Israel. Ifat has done more than break the glass ceiling. She is smashing it. The Jerusalem Post refers to her as Blackstone's secret weapon and listed her on its list of the top 50 most influential Jews of 2021. Ifat leads Blackstone's growth and technology investments in Israel and assists with other investing efforts across the firm. Prior to joining Blackstone, she was the CEO of Lumitech, a leading Israeli technology banking platform. Yifat spent most of her career as a partner at Veritex Venture Capital, an Israeli-based venture fund. Prior to Veritex, she was a technology investment banking associate with J.P. Morgan Chase in New York. Yifat spent three years at the directorate of the R&D of the Israeli Ministry of Defense, where she achieved the rank of lieutenant. She holds an MBA from Tel Aviv University and a BS in economics and management from the Technion. Aaron Tartakovsky is a Tel Aviv University alum, governor, and an American Friends of Tel Aviv University board member. He is also the creator of Tau Talks. It was his idea and his vision to have an honest, everything you ever wanted to know about business success conversation. Aaron is the CEO and co-founder of Epic Clean Tech, a Bay Area startup which decentralizes wastewater treatment for the benefit of the environment. He is a graduate of Tufts University and holds a master's degree in political science in security and diplomacy from Tel Aviv University. It is now my pleasure to introduce Ifat and Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you all for being here with us. And this thank you especially, Ifat, for being with us. It is evening time in Israel, so you've had a long day of work and you're making time for us. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Very exciting to be here. Thanks. You know, Jennifer mentioned, you know, we created this forum to, to, to really highlight the leaders, the entrepreneurs, the thought leaders, the people who are, you know, reshaping industries, who are leading global businesses. And certainly, as, as your introduction introduced, you have a very prominent platform now as the Senior Managing Director at Blackstone running their Tel Aviv office. So we're going to find out about that. We want to hear about your predictions for the future where the world is going. But first, as with any good discussion, we need to find out a little bit more about your story. My, my mother is a psychiatrist, so we always like to start with, tell us about your childhood. Not many kids dream about being a world-leading investor or a business titan. So what, when you were growing up, what did you think you were going to be when you grew up? I, you know, it's very hard to think or to know what you thought as a child, because many of the things sort of uh, happen retrospectively. But I, I think that growing up in a, in a house that had business discussions going on, I think deep down inside, I, I found that interesting. Um, and the reason is because I listened. If I didn't find it interesting, you know, those conversations, sometimes you, you don't even notice they happen. Mm -hmm. And I will say something, it's, it's a little bit funny, but um, many, many years after I grew up and I became an investment banker in Wall Street, my mother actually reminded me something that I, I didn't remember, but uh, apparently she took me to watch when I was about 11 years old. Um, this shows my, my age now. Uh, when I was 11, I, I went to watch the movie Wall Street uh, with Michael Douglas. And this movie has come back to my life a bunch of times because um, I ended up working at JP Morgan uh, more than a decade, more than a decade after for a person who was running the business there, who I think, and I'm not sure until today, but I think he was sort of a, the person that the movie was based on, uh, the banker from JP Morgan. He looked like Michael Douglas. Uh, so I, my mother told me when I when I started working for JP Morgan, she said, well, you always wanted 
to work at Wall Street. That's what you said to, after the movie. So, you know, the seeds I, were, I, get, the seeds were I guess that. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah. interesting. And so, you know, I think what's interesting about your story is that you grew up, you were born in Israel, you spent your early years in Israel, but then you, you came over to the United States. Big move, big move. Yeah. So when I was about 16, a little older than 16, uh, my family moved to the United States. This was for business reasons uh, of my father. And I found myself moving from a small town in Israel to a very nice suburb uh, in New York uh, called Scarsdale, to those of you who know. And let me tell you, that was night and day. I remember calling my friends back home and trying to explain to them, you know, what is this thing? And it, I couldn't really, because you had to be there to understand. Um, I, um, I'll tell you, I, I think this is, if I were to sort of think of what is the biggest, one of the biggest presents I got from my family, my parents, I think this was probably one of the, the best ones because, you know, some people don't appreciate such relocations. I think I did actually in real time mm -hmm. that an opportunity like that is something that, you know, prepares you to life and, and opens doors that you may not ever be able to open without that. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that if, if I can just say one more thing that is very important to me, and I don't know how many in, our, in the audience, how many are, are younger than I am <laughs> who still have options to move around the world and um, I, I want to endorse it as, as much as possible because the ability, and again, most Americans maybe don't appreciate it as much, but I came from a small town. Most of us, although we thought we're very eclectic because some of us were Polish, some of us were Iraqi, some of us were Yemenite, at the end of the day, we were very similar, uh, extremely similar. And when I moved to New York, I, and all of a sudden I had a high school, I, I attended a high school where, you know, I had Japanese friends and Korean and Indian and Brazilian and of course American. Only then did I start to understand that, wow, you know, they're different types of people and they don't think like us. And I, you know, I was very intrigued to, to sort of understand the culture. And for many, many years later, I've unconsciously utilized those skills of understanding that the others are not necessarily like me uh, and appreciate the different the differences in cultures. And I think throughout my career, I have ended up working with people from around the world. And I think that knowing that from young age prepares you, in my case, for business. In other cases, you know, people can be better artists or better whatever. Uh, but I think it definitely enriches you as a human being, such exposure. Absolutely. I mean, I think it makes perfect sense, the, the ability to sort of understand and read other people and having that cultural sensitivity seems like that was definitely a, a gift for you uh, for, for, yeah. for personal, professional and everything else. Well, that's great. And, and, you know, you mentioned who's on this call today. And so I, I'd be remiss not to just acknowledge that we have Tel Aviv University board members in both in America, around the world. We have people from Israel, from the business school at the College School of Management, and we do have a large group of folks who are younger in their careers. And so I think there's a lot of people right. here who want to <laughs> learn about your, your trajectory, because of course, you know, when you're in your 20s and your 30s and you're thinking about how do I get to where I want to be in my career, it's, it's always very inspiring to hear, hear these stories. So I think that's why we're going to continue this trajectory now to figure out how did we end up to where we are today. So it's... You're 16, you moved to Scarsdale, New York. What, what happens next? Uh, what happens next was that I didn't want to go back home, uh, not because I don't like Israel. Obviously I like Israel, I live here now, uh, but I felt that I had to get a little more, more of this American dream. Ended up, long story short, ended up uh, finishing high school and going to college. Uh, and can I can I tell another funny story about that? We welcome all how, the fun. how how culture is different. So when I was looking for colleges, uh, I, I went my dad and I went to see one of the schools and there was a tour and it was a, a bus tour and a, la a lady was describing a bunch of things about the university. And then she said, and Greek life is very, very advanced here. 
And both my dad and I thought there were a lot of Greek immigrants because we had no idea what a Greek life means. Sure. Ended up, ended up going to UPenn and understanding what Greek life means and enrolling in a sorority because, as I told you, I wanted to do the, every, every single beat of the American uh, dream that I could. So that was, a, yet again, how, um, <laughs> how cultures are, are different. Yeah, so I, so I did, I, I started un, in un, uh, UPenn actually in a very, very um, lucrative but demanding program. It was an engineering and finance joint degree, mm -hmm. dual degree. Uh, funny enough, half my professors were Israeli professors who I met later on in other schools that I <laughs> went to in, in, um, in Israel. Uh, after three semesters, I was uh, asked kindly, politely by the military to come back home. Uh, I had to go back to service the army because I left Israel after I was 16. And I was very happy to do so. I got three semesters of Penn. That was more, more than I can you know, dream of. Uh, so I ended up moving back to Israel, but not enrolling directly in the military. I did, um, I don't know, the, the, the parallel is probably ROTC program. So I uh, uh, moved into the, from UPenn to the Technion Institute of Technology in Haifa, uh, finished my undergraduate degree, and then went to work for, as, as a lieutenant for the Ministry of uh, Defense, R&D. And so when, and what were you doing, what were you doing there? So it's, it's funny because when I look back, this was the first time that I started it, but it consistently stayed that way of doing work that integrates finance and technology. So mm -hmm. what the directorate of R&D does is to fund, uh, manage and fund R&D projects for the military and other areas in, in the defense business. And, you know, I'm not, not going to talk specifically about what I did, but um, one of the things that came out, and it's a public thing, it's not a secret, uh, that came out from when I was there, I didn't invent it, but I was there, was uh, Iron Dome as an example. So these are strategic strategic um, projects that, that we've uh, managed and funded. Uh, great experience. Uh, it wasn't, it, it's not a typical military service because it, engages people that are both uh, servicing, but also empl regular employees. But uh, yeah, three years of uh, great pleasure with a lot of smart people around me, a lot of smart people around me. Sure. Yeah. And, and you know, maybe we'll, we'll circle back to that in a little bit, sort of what that experience was, um, you know, essentially running businesses within the army of doing this, this type of R&D work. Um, but just to continue on the trajectory, so you were in the army for three years and then and then what, where did you go next? <laughs> then, like every, you know, people in, in Israel compared to, for the, compared to the U.S., our decision-making starts post-military sometimes and not post-school. Uh, so that was my sort of, okay, what, what do I want to do? And I ended up not knowing what I want to do. And because of that, I, and I wanted to do consulting work because I've, I've had a bunch of people surrounding me telling me, you know, if you don't know, go to, go to some kind of a role where you're exposed to as many industries as one can be exposed to in a very short time. And in hindsight, that was uh, a, a great advice, which for the, for the younger uh, crowd on the call, I highly recommend. So if you know what you want to do, that's wonderful. If you don't, try to get to a position that opens a, a very wide um, sort of roadmap for you for later on. Uh, you don't have to retire doing consulting, but I think it's a great, well, you could, but I think it's a great start for somebody who who's still debating. Um, I, I did that, but I did, I, and now I'm going to tell a little bit about my Tel Aviv University experience because sure. while I was in the military and thanks to the uh, flexibility of the university at the time and obviously also now, uh, they allow students to, to do their MBAs at crazy hours uh, mm -hmm. for those who, who work or, or in the military. So I, I actually did my uh, MBA mostly at nights uh, huh. at Tel Aviv University. Yeah, yeah. 
And uh, I continued doing it after I graduated from the military, did that when I was a consultant. And then the miracle happens. Can I tell you what the miracle was? Yes. <laughs> so I was literally post whatever, what, I don't remember, finance class, it was probably 10 p.m., really tired because I had worked all day also. And then I saw on the on the corridors of, of, of the uh, faculty, I saw, I saw a small note. It was a pink note saying that there is an opening. They're starting to open up a possibility for students to do a exchange program around the world, anywhere they want around the world. I saw that note and I uh, went right into the student. I don't remember what it was called, but the student secretariat or something. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, where do I sign? And this pretty much was uh, the beginning of my change of career because uh, thanks to Tel Aviv University, it allowed me to, uh, to do an exchange program at NYU. So I returned back to New York mm -hmm. for a semester. And that's when I started my, my sort of Wall Street uh, experience because through NYU, I got to the recruiting uh, process. And uh, long story short, I got a job at JP Morgan. So for those of you who are Tel Aviv University people, thank you. <laughs> major, major, major force in my life, this, this move, so. And it's amazing that you were, you were walking in a hallway and it was a, a single post-it that changed everything for you. Everything, amazing. everything. It was pink. So whoever did it at pink knew what they were doing. Because maybe <laughs> if it was blue, I would never notice. <laughs> oh, it caught your attention, which is great. So you, so now, so now you ended up on Wall Street. So you had been in New York, you were back in Israel, and and you know actually something I think is interesting is that you have a unique perspective of having been both on a, an American university campus and also on an Israeli campus. You experienced Greek life with that, which is something that many Israelis cannot say they have done. Um, <laughs> and and I think it's something that oftentimes we, especially you know whether it's in Europe or in the U.S. We, we, we lose sight of that. You know, for many of us, when we leave home for the first time, it's when we're 18, we're going to college or university. That's sort of our first, our first time leaving the nest. And it's not the same in Israel where, you know, we go, we live in the dorms. That's our first time away. For many Israelis like you, it's after the army where you're going through this university experience. So it's a, it's a very different, it's a very different experience. And, you know, I'm curious yeah. if you have sort of any thoughts on, 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 on that juxtaposition? Um, I, I think that leaving home at 18 is hard for everybody. It's mm -hmm. a shock for everybody. Um, so, so, so the whole thing of, of becoming independent, you know, takes different forms, but it happens around the world. The main difference, if I were to compare sort of undergraduate students in America to undergraduate students in Israel, it's very, very different. Mm -hmm. um, the, first of all, the age difference. It's at least three years difference. Um, and also Israelis, the three-year army thing makes the difference even more because you're really mature uh, in, in most of the, the services that are there. So I think that it, and by the way, it has a positive thing and a negative thing, because I think that because Israelis get to university at a stage where they're much older <laughs> um, and they're uh, more stressed on some of the times to, to work during school, I think that as Israelis, we're missing a lot of what our counterparties in America are benefiting from. The ability, and, and again, not everybody is enjoying the same style of school in America, but if you go to, to a private school or a school with, with, you know, the dorms and this whole atmosphere, this is something that is very tough. It's very tough. And in, in Israeli university try to do things that are similar, but it's very tough to replicate that when, when people are much older. Some, sometimes they're already married. Sometimes they have already, they have kids, they have to work. 
So they're running around and, and whereas, whereas in America, you know, it's, it's, it's a wonderful incubator, right? Uh, you're fully immersed. Uh, so yeah, so it's, it's really, really not, not that comparable. Um, yeah. But, but look, I'm, I'm talking quite a while back. It, it may, may have changed since, um, yeah. but it's well, a little different. You know, now when you walk on the campus of Tel Aviv University on Thursday, you see everyone out there at the student fair having beers, and it starts to look a little bit more like a okay. university. Okay. We're starting to see a little bit of a, a coming together. Of hope. But I'll tell you, but I'll tell you also why. First, first of all, I think universities are, are doing what, and Tel Aviv University obviously are, are, is changing also. Mm -hmm. But I also think that we, we are more international. Mm -hmm. So now we know what we're missing. And we're trying to, <laughs> and we're trying to get all you know all the benefits of also being a student. Uh, no, I'm 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 joking. I, I think I think that universities are investing more today in making the experience uh, maybe more 360 and a lot more um, social as well as academic. Uh, I think. I wouldn't know because I finished my last time in school many, many years ago. Sure. But I think that's where it's going. Sure. Well, and so let's let's get back on the on your your professional journey. So you 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 landed up in Wall Street. Uh, you were living in New York, and um, you know maybe just to sort of skip ahead a little bit. When we when we last met, you were at Lumitech. Um, and for for those who don't know here on the call, can you talk a little bit about Lumitech and what you were doing there? Okay, so Lumitech, which I'm very, very proud of, is the business that we founded within the Bank Lumi group. Bank Lumi is one of the largest two banks in Israel. And back, this is back in end of 2013, uh, we already have a wonderful startup nation, uh, probably two decades of startups growing up and funds funding them and exits are happening. And we have a very, very full, uh, sophisticated ecosystem for technology innovation. However, we were completely lacking as a nation, the banking system as part of this ecosystem. So the banks, for whatever reason, were not really part of this thing called Startup Nation. Um, and what our goal was, to be able to have the banking system, well, we started with Lumi Tech, but you can imagine all the other banks followed suit, that the banks would actually understand the tech business and provide the right services and provide lending, many things that, uh, as funny as it may sound, did not exist amongst the Israeli banking system. And I joined Bank Lumi to start this and lead Lumi Tech in beginning of 2014. Mm -hmm. And the, the, the <laughs> there was such a great need for those services that luckily for us, you know, the business grew extremely fast mm -hmm. uh, because there was dire straits because nobody had given the startups what they needed. Um, I don't know if you want to dive into, you know, what does it mean to be a banker for tech, but it's not trivial at all. Well, I think yeah, I do. And I think it's an interesting piece. You, you said the bankers need to understand the technology. Now, of course, you know, sometimes when you think about the technologies we're discussing, this is the bleed, you know, the cutting edge or even the bleeding edge, you know, very few people sometimes really understand that. So what, what did that mean for you that the bank needed to really understand that? Yeah. So maybe before before I talk about that, I just sure. want to explain to people how tech and banking is so it's so different, because banks like um, proof they want to see businesses that make money. They want to be able to predict how much money they're going to make, and they really want to work with companies and and clients that their probability of going under is very, very, very low. All of what I just said is <laughs> doesn't resonate within, within technology. So when I, and, and actually when, when I said you have to know technology, I don't mean that you need to know how to code 
mm-hmm. or how to develop drugs or, you know, this is not what I mean. I think that being a banker for tech means that you have to understand what it, what is it about a tech startup? What do I need to see to be able to provide services while not losing a lot of money? Um, it doesn't mean that company that we only worked with those who had a hundred percent success rate, but you had to understand where there are at the, at the growth cycle and the maturity cycle and things like, I'll give, I'll give you an example. So obviously all the companies, not all, but a lot of the startups we worked with were losing money and therefore they had, um, investors, they had funds. When you look at a company, you don't need to know how to write code, but you do need to understand how a software company differs from a clean tech company at a certain whatever, because it really is a very different story. There, it's not you know one fits all. Some of them can be very very quick to market with you know uh, the, their first sales. So software companies sometimes less than a year from being founded, they already have revenues. And if we're talking clean tech and you're in clean tech, some of the projects in clean tech are, are not that easy to, to, to the, the actual physics is not easy. Um, not necessarily the market, but to get to a product and a technology that's proven and, and, and it's cost effective. It sometimes takes years. So when you're a banker and you're judging a company, you have to understand those differences. You have to understand what type of investors are around the table. Are they going to be able to be walking hand in hand with you as a bank for the long run, or are they too small and, and don't have what it takes? And then you may want to suggest the further round, et cetera, et cetera. So what I mean is not really knowing how to diligence the code or whatever, the, the physics. It's more about the dynamics of technology, how do rounds happen? You know, what are things that a company does that, you know, are going to hinge on its ability to fundraise, which is for us as a bank was was very important. So I think that that's more of what I meant. And sure. um, I we didn't mention it, but I, I had moved to uh, launch uh, and found Lumitech after ten years of um, venture capital investing. And venture capital investing, not in this decade, but the decade before when I was in, investing wasn't that trivial. And uh, money was not abundant as it is now. And so I was very, very aware, very much aware of the dynamics of what type of businesses require what types of money, because usually they they had to manage with much less than what companies manage with right now. So, So the dynamics of how it works and what it takes was something that, um, I think helped me to become, you know, the, and I was the right person in the world to be uh, leading this effort. And now everybody Lumitech knows. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, you're at Lumitech for, for how long were you at Lumitech? Seven years. Seven, seven years. years. And very recently, you took another very exciting position running the, the Israeli office for, for Blackstone, where you're leading their, their tech investments. And so can you tell us a little bit about that role and, and what is your mandate now at Blackstone? Wonderful question. So Blackstone, well, I hope that most of the audience here know about Blackstone, but Blackstone is currently, um, it's, a, it's a big asset manager and investment house. Uh, we're managing as of now, $880 billion in several investment strategies. Uh, a lot of it is around private equity. We have a very big practice in real estate. We have a practice in energy and new energy. We have a practice in uh, lending, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I will say about the relationship between Blackstone and Israel is that Blackstone traditionally and continues to be so uh, is investing relatively large uh, checks. Uh, and if I if I pause for a second about uh, Blackstone and I go back to sort of the Israeli ecosystem, I think that something that has dramatically changed here is around the fact that we used to be 
we were we were always entrepreneurial, but in the first two decades of our startup nation story, we have mainly worked around or innovated around technologies that make things move better or enable other industries to work better. Um, and such such solutions sort of had a glass ceiling to them. Uh, and a lot of what we've seen in Israel in the first 20 years of, of Startup Nation is we've seen companies growing the products to a certain maturity and then ending up being sold. Just as a matter of perspective, we had, if we look at between 1995 and probably 2010, um, even later, uh, 85 or so percent of exits were M&A exits. Uh, all of which, maybe, I think 100% of which were to other tech giants. Um, and what has changed dramatically for, by the way, for because of a bunch of factors, it's not just one uh, factor, is that the Israeli tech ecosystem has significantly matured. Uh, we, like I said, we used to sell early. Companies, average average. Uh, M&A was about $110 million, which was great numbers, but um, but a lot of the companies did not materialize all of their potential while they were private. And then a lot of the potential ended up uh, be, being uh, exploited by, by whoever acquired them. And what, has, what happened was that we matured and our companies moved from being an enabler to being the actual business, many of them. And we have grown uh, enough to get attention from the investment community around the world to attract late stage financing, which we completely lacked on the ground. And so all of a sudden we have companies that wanna grow and can become much larger. We have the funds that know how to follow the VCs or potentially buy some of their position to allow for the company to maintain, not necessarily private, but independent. And uh, we're seeing a lot more companies or actually, I don't, I don't even know if there is any entrepreneur today that will actually say that he's planning on selling him, him or herself in an M&A situation. Everyone is aiming at an IPO, everyone. Some, some end up getting some, you know, nice offers and they sell the company, but nobody's planning on that, where we used to be completely planning for it. So that fact has made Israel, and thank God, we, we also have great entrepreneurs and engineers. And so that has put us in a place where the breadth and depth of what we have here on the ground has become very, very large and interesting. And all of a sudden firms like Blackstone understands that there is enough velocity of deals that could be relevant for the funds that we manage. Specifically, or more so with our Blackstone Growth Fund, uh, it's called BXG, but it could also be from our other funds, so our private equity or uh, whatnot. So, uh, so I'm going back to Blackstone. I think Blackstone has always recognized Israel uh, and has, you know, known Israel and spoke to uh, interesting companies in Israel. But I think that this move of actually having people on the ground is because one cannot ignore Israel anymore, even when you're managing um, such such large amounts of money. Now, again, Blackstone is not the first to recognize. We have great colleagues here, uh, but I think that what the, the really big difference uh, that Blackstone brings to the table is that what we're trying to do is we're, we're trying to be a partner of choice along with a lot of our friends here um, and, and sort of enable uh, the platform of Blackstone, the great Blackstone to the Israeli uh, companies and entrepreneurs. And we really invest a lot of efforts into uh, helping out. Um, all the funds help out, but we also like to provide value. And, and we think we have quite a lot of value just because we are all over the world with great companies that are portfolio companies of ours, uh, great talent and 
you know, the sky's the limit uh, when it comes to um, value creation. It's exciting. It's an exciting, it's an exciting position you have. And, and, you know, you, you touched upon something that's interesting, which is we hear a lot. I think many people on this call have heard about the story of the startup nation. Um, we've, I think we've all read the book. We all probably have multiple copies of the book that we give out to our friends. And, you know, now we're in this position of it's no longer startup nation, it's scale up nation. These are, these are companies, as you've said, that are not just trying to get built and bought. They're actually trying to build um, businesses. And I think, you know, something that we hear about sometimes is, you know, Israel as a market is not a big market. Uh, that is, you know, largely just in terms of the population, in terms of how many people you can actually sell to. But I think another interesting question that I'd like to get your thoughts on is, is the talent pool is you have these big companies growing in Israel. Um, is there enough talent? Now, obviously, I would love to say, yes, Tel Aviv University can supply all of the talent you would ever need. But being realistic, that seems like a challenge. I'm, I'm curious to get your thoughts on sort of what, what you see on the ground. That's a bunch, of, a bunch of stuff here. So before the talent, I'll just say on the large companies, I, I think, honestly, <laughs> If you ask any investment professional, would they think that we would have decacorns traded in ASIC in the amount that we do? Nobody would admit. I mean, maybe people will say they would, but don't believe them. Um, so I think this, it's, it's a major issue. And, and I, I think if I try to look back to what was that thing in history, according to my theory, <laughs> that changed people's minds. I think these were two, essentially two stories. The first one was Waze. I was in a fund uh, that was invested in Waze and I, and I remember the feedbacks, people didn't understand the story, but it was really one of the first brands that Israel had produced because we, we used to have technologies and solutions, but we were not branded. And all of a sudden you have a company that I remember because they broke out big time around the LA traffic problems and somebody in some morning show mentioned their name, uh, which created a huge buzz. And, and I think this was the first Israeli company to be actually recognized by people who have no idea what the word startup nation means, they don't know where Israel is on the map, but they know ways. And then when it was sold, uh, according to foreign press, above a billion dollars, people started thinking, wow, we thought we don't know how to do consumer, but maybe we know a thing or two about consumer. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we moved away from like deep tech enabling stuff to consumer internet and things that we weren't that big on. Other than, by the way, the sector of gaming, which we're, we're very big on. Um, and then I think the other very important milestone was um, the acquisition of Intel that when they, when they bought Mobileye. And the reason I think that was a huge story is because Waze resonated around what we could do with consumer and, you know, grabbing market share around the world and people knowing it's Israeli, but then Mobileye has made a lot of investors wake up and say, whoa, where, where did this come from? What is this mobile eye? And I think you can literally see in the growth of the investment of the monies that came into Israel and for growth grew a lot after that event. Because people always knew Israel is a manufacturer of technology, but people not necessarily thought that there could be huge companies. So we had our, you know, eclectic types of VCs, whatever, but Mobileye had actually brought in the big, big boys. Um, so I think, I think like if, if we think about the changes, so we have big companies. Another important thing, and this relates to your talent question. We used to think that you have to be moving from whatever, Ranana or Tel Aviv or whatever, when the company starts having customers, you have to move to Silicon Valley or Boston. Back then it was Boston for cyber. Cyber before it was called cyber, it was called security. Um, and 
the big change that happened is that Israeli entrepreneurs started saying, well, I don't want to move. I'm an internet, I'm a global company. I'm selling not only to American, uh, to America, I'm selling to Europe, I'm selling to Japan. I don't need to live in California. I can live in Tel Aviv or whatever. And that was a huge change, huge change. Because when you have the, 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 the CEO of the company is located in Israel, most of the HQ stays in Israel. Mm -hmm. So then you have the C levels, some of them, not all of them. And a lot of the peripheral, you know, uh, not peripheral, but uh, a lot of the talent that's not necessarily only R&D. And that has made a big change in the Israeli community because the tech, um, tech, the tech ecosystem employs many more people and need a lot more people. And now we're hitting what I call our biggest challenge uh, around the continuing success of, of Israeli tech. And this is around, it's around talent. Um, from everything I hear, we're lacking thousands of thousands of, of, of people that companies would have wanted to hire and cannot find them here. Luckily for us, most of the entrepreneurs and CEOs are, are insisting on finding them here. And we can talk about what, what is being done. Some of them just don't have any other choice and, and they go abroad, but most of them are insisting and, and are trying to nurture the ecosystem. But this is a major issue because when a hub like Israel wants to compete and have the best companies in the world, and then you have Silicon Valley with some kind of talent issue, and then you have India, who's also in the race, and Germany, who's also in the race, and the UK, London, the numbers there are a little different than, what we, than ours, unfortunately. So, so uh, there is some, there is some people are worried here uh, on on the ability to produce enough talent, um, but people are doing things to to try to solve it. So, I'll, I'll just name a few. So, first of all, we're trying all of us in some fashion are trying to bring over, bring across. Uh, under uh, represented groups uh, from within Israel. So it's Haredi, you know, uh, women who are not as much in uh, uh, the Arab uh, ecosystem who is starting to take more of a role, which is amazing. And then companies are also assuming on themselves to do all kinds of uh, academies, you, if you wish, or boot camps. Um, to bring people that have some, some academic background, but to, to sort of bring them up to speed to become um, uh, something in their company. And it's starting to be taking a, a higher priority by everybody because everybody wants to make sure that we stay strong uh, as a nation, yeah. That's great. And, you know, I think I've never heard, I never heard the Israeli story be told sort of with those those milestones of ways and mobile before. So I think it's an interesting way for, for us to sort of frame the, the history of the Israeli ecosystem, which I'm sure one day what you're saying now will be put into the history books of the Israeli tech scene. Uh, but for everyone here, you heard it first, uh, right here on this Tao Talk. The, ne the, next one, the next one would be the first $50 billion Israeli company. And uh, there are a lot of bets on that, but... I'm not going to mention anyone. <laughs> and, 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 let's, and, and let's talk. Well, well that's, we don't need to talk about specific companies, but um, you know, I think there's there's a quote that was that recently got a lot of attention from from Larry Fink, where he said the next 1,000 unicorns will be green energy companies. And you know, we've talked we've talked today about um, you know the focus that Israel has has sort of seen on cyber, on energy, on AI, on fintech. Um, but, you know, coming from my vantage point, looking at sort of the broad world of, of climate tech, where we see 14% of all of EC investment right now going into climate tech in the last few years, um, you know, that seems to be a big trend. And, and, and I'm curious to get your thoughts when it comes to climate tech, when it comes to ESG. Uh, do you think that is, is this going to be a, a temporary fad that fades, fades away or is this going to be sort of the, the trend of the future? So thank you for the question. Um, 
I, I'll say one one thing about Israel and a little bit about also about Blackstone. Israel, if you think about it, uh, has invested in clean energy and, and alternative energy forever. Uh, I don't know how many of you know, but Israel has been using solar to heat our water since I remember, and it was before I was born. So we, we didn't have a choice uh, not to do that. Now the world doesn't have a choice, but we as a nation didn't have a choice, which, you know, it's, it's always uh, things like this happen because of necessity. So right. we had a lot of investment into, uh, now it's called food tech, but we've been investing in food technology forever. If you all remember the, the special tomato and, you know, milk wise, we are the most producing milk per cow in the world. I mean, we, we've been doing this forever. We just didn't use the, the branding. Uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't sound as sexy as it does now, but we've been doing it forever. There is a movement, uh, well, obviously, you know, solar and, and water related technology and irrigation. You look at the map of irrigation, most of it is Israeli companies leading the world. So, so we're there. <clears throat> a bunch of specific stuff that was highlighted in the last few years uh, is around energy, energy storage. And two specific things that I, I touch upon is, is food technology and uh, uh, ag tech. So food tech and ag tech. And I remember uh, just, I'm, I'm relatively close to it. And, and I've, I remember when the food tech stuff started about six years ago, maybe seven, it was like, you know, what, what is this thing? Now we have about 500 food tech companies, some of whom recently raised hundreds of millions of dollars with names that people know around the world. Um, and by the way, I'm not surprised because one thing about food technology, <clears throat> which Israel is, I think, relevant around, is that food, similarly to some other industries, is a lot about uh, the convergence, and, and I'll mention in a second another thing, but a convergence of disciplines. So it's not necessarily only about biology or phys physics or mechanics. The real and interesting food tech companies encompass all those disciplines and that need to talk to each other. And this is something that Israeli tech has always been good at. This is why we were very, very good at medical devices because we've managed to put, you know, the doctors with the, with the engineers. And so I think that if you look at Israel, <clears throat> even without knowing all of what I said, is this the right place to nurture food and ag tech? Of course, AI is now a big issue across many industries. But for example, in agri-tech, we have a bunch of companies that are utilizing AI for, for various things. How do you make bees more productive? How do you water? How do you interpret weather? I mean, so... Um, I don't know, I'm, I'm obviously not objective, but, but it, it, it almost seems obvious for Israel to have all these things um, coming out of them. And, and, you know, we also have very, very large companies that are already well proven and I'm happy to have taken part of them in their life, uh, in their in their uh, existence is, is Solar Reg is an example. I was, uh, I led their round B and I, I sat on the board for many years. It's an amazing company. Um, so yeah, so I think it's it's very very interesting, huge potential, and Israel is 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 probably one of the best hubs to one of the best, not the only, uh, to nurture those. And in terms of Blackstone, I'll just say that we put a lot of emphasis on, on ESG, and starting from simple things like cutting carbon from the employees. You know, we travel less, we use heating less. We just save carbon. Um, and also we have specific dedicated funds that are <clears throat> that were raised to be able to invest in um, clean energy and uh, all, all ESG related. By the way, ESG is way beyond clean energy. This is around how do you go, you know, your governance and diversity and, and a lot of other things. Right, right. Well, one I can confirm one thing you said in the water industry. You know, here in California, this is a big 
big topic of conversation for us. You cannot go to a single water conference in the United States and not hear about Israel. <laughs> Israel is, is, is covered in every single conference. Um, so, you know, to say that Israel is leading the way, I can confirm uh, firsthand that that is, that is in, in fact the case. And because we are sort of coming up on time, I did want to make sure we address some of the questions I'm getting people texting me and writing in. Um, so we have a question, an interesting question from a, a Tel Aviv University governor, board member, Bezad Kianmad, and he's asking about, um, you know, a lot of these amazing Israeli companies doing amazing things with technology, this interdisciplinary approach you're talking about. Uh, many of them are smaller. You know, Blackstone is a big player. So what is sort of the threshold uh, for a size of a company that you all would, would consider uh, working with? Wow. Uh, thank you again for the question, because this helps me explain our strategy. So Blackstone is not trying to sort of take away business from all our friends, all the VCs, the local VCs. Blackstone has men, is mentioning all the time. We're supposed to come in after the Israeli VCs have grew the companies to a certain level where it needs the really big checks and help around the world. Uh, this is th this is only when we, this is uh, the the point we get in. We do not intend to go downstream and sort of start to uh, race on the early stage investments. You know, this is, we're in, we're in a different uh, lifetime or yeah, life stage of those companies. Understood. And I'm getting a question, this, this may be a tough one with so little time, but I got a question about the Abraham Accords. And, and what that has enabled in terms of sort of regional cooperation, being able to work with, with neighboring countries that just a few years ago you couldn't. Could you, could you comment on that briefly? I would love that. I, first of all, on a personal note, I was, in, um, I was in the UAE literally the day of the signing in Washington. Oh. There's was a bunch of us there. And we all had goosebumps because it was very, very emotional. We were so happy to be there. Who would have thought, right? This was beyond anybody's dreams. So one, this is amazing. Just peace is a good thing. <laughs> but when you have peace that comes with potential mutual business, it's even better. And I think that what this combination brings is something that really couldn't have been achieved otherwise. Israeli companies are selling until today to the US, Europe, lesser extent to South America, but we don't sell anything to that region of the world. And if I'm not mistaken, there is about 1.3 billion people that are now a market that with our relationship with the uh, UAE now, who are going to be our colleagues and our partners who can sell into those regions, this is a huge opportunity, huge. And I cannot express enough the, the belief that I have that I think this is huge, a huge step to Israel because of, again, because we have new friends and new friends who wanna work with us and they wanna visit us and they want us to visit them. And I've been there a bunch of times and I get excited every time again and again. And I think this, this is going to also, it's not the main thing, I don't think, but it's also going to bring a lot of economic value to both sides because it's a win-win. It's not a one directional thing. Well, that's exciting to hear from you. Certainly a nice, a nice optimistic note uh, as we conclude here. And I think one, one question um, that I always like to ask, especially someone who's, who's younger in his career is, what advice do you have for, for those of us on this call who are just, just getting started? Wow. Um, <laughs> big, big question. Big question. I, I will say from, from, from my old age that a happy person is a person that found a career, whatever it is, that enjoys two things. One is that 
the person is good at what they do, and two, that they enjoy what they do. And many of us don't understand it. Usually, <laughs> we understand it at a later stage in life. And so don't, don't try to do what people told you you need to do. Uh, if you don't feel comfortable, find the place you feel comfortable. Because if you are not comfortable, you're not going to do well. It's just something that, <laughs> you know, feeds itself. So that's, that's probably the main old woman uh, suggestion that I have. Um, <laughs> um, another thing is just get used to the fact that, um, and if you're specifically, if you're in school and you think that you're in school and then you finish school and you're done learning, well, that's not the, that's not the case. Be prepared to be learning and studying all the time. By the way, especially when you're investing because the investment world is just changing. You have to be on top of everything all the time, but it's actually relevant to any other thing. So if you're a doctor, if you're whatever. So that, that's some, it's, it's not a recommendation, it's a wake up call for those who think they will actually finish school one day. It never ends. <laughs> well, I think for a Tel Aviv University discussion to, to, to encourage the continuous pursuit of learning, I think is a very appropriate way to, to bring this to a close. But I, I just did want to say thank you so much for, for joining us. You know, Tel Aviv University, as we like to say, it's about the big ideas and finding the next big ideas. Certainly from your vantage point now, you are very literally helping to find and nurture the big ideas that are going to change the world, that are going to affect all of us in our everyday lives. So uh, it's it was an inspiration to be able to hear from you. Thank you for taking the time out of your evening to speak with us. And thank you all for joining us for this Tao Talk. Uh, more to come. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Aaron. <laughs>